service for Ed Fleming. And what a tribute this is to Ed. Uh, I have seldom seen so many people present for a memorial service. And Terry, Randy, I want y'all just for one moment to stand up and turn around and look. Just stand up and just look at all these people, all these people who came in uh, to honor your dad. And I know Jennifer has already, Jennifer has already, um, she's already looked. So what a tribute. And uh, thank you for coming. Uh, thanks to Mississippi. Uh, every congregation in Mississippi is here. Uh, Van Cleve, Ocean Springs, Escataba. Uh, and of course, many people from Robertsdale, and uh, I'm sure I'm, I'm missing some other congregations, but uh, I am blessed just by looking at all of you. And I know I speak for the, uh, I know I speak for Ed's family. Uh, some of us are, uh, some of us belong to Ed's, Ed's family, Ed and Charlene's family. Uh, we're children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, uh, <clears throat> brother and sister-in-law. There's cousins here, uh, related in different ways. Some of us belong to uh, Ed's, his large family of friends. And a lot of us belong to uh, Ed's church family, don't we? And, and so in our own personal way, most of us have known Ed well for a lot of years. Uh, we know his story, don't we? We know his story. We know the kind of man that he is, and notice I said is, because uh, as Christian people, we know that Ed is an is. He's not a was. Uh, Ed is present tense. He's not, he's not past tense. Uh, we know that Ed Fleming is alive right now. In fact, we know that Ed is more alive right now than he's ever, ever been in his life uh, as he now experiences eternal life in a, in a fuller dimension. And so with, with Christian people uh, everywhere, we proclaim, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, should not perish, but have everlasting life. The first Christians were accused of turning the world upside down. And one way we turn the world upside down is by how we look at death. Uh, the world fears death. Uh, to the world, death is the biggest enemy, but, but we look at it, we look at death differently. Uh, because of Jesus Christ, his life, his death, crucifixion, and his resurrection, uh, we know that death is not a dead end but rather it is, it's a doorway, a doorway to eternal life. And so, we, we don't fear death as an enemy, do we? Uh, and, and my testimony is that, that when death came to Ed Wednesday, Ed welcomed it. He welcomed death as a friend. Now, Make no mistake, uh, we are sad, and, and some of us are very sad, and some of us are broken hearted. Uh, we loved Ed. Uh, 
He is an important person. Our, our father, our grandfather, how much more important can you get? And uh, no one can take Ed's place. Uh, and we miss him. But even in our sadness, even in our sadness, uh, we celebrate. Uh, we are sad, but we're not sad for Ed. We, we celebrate, and, and it's in that spirit of celebration that we now have this memorial service. This, is a, this will be a service of celebration. And to help us begin our celebration, uh, someone who was a good friend of Ed's, George Farnell will sing a great hymn, a hymn that Ed loves. It's a hymn that thanks and praises God, Jesus Christ. The hymn is How Great Thou Art. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. When through the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down, fears, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. When Christ shall come, with shout of acclamation, and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration, and then proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Ed loved the scriptures. He loved the word of God. Uh, he, he loved the Bible. And in a few moments, I'm going to show you his Bible. But he loved the Bible and he, he studied it. As a member of the community of Christ, he also loved two additional books, the Book of Mormon and the Book of Doctrine and Covenants. And to, to celebrate, to help celebrate Ed, uh, I want to read passages from, from these three books of Scripture. From the Bible, 14th chapter of John, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And when I go, I will prepare a place for you and come again 
and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. From the Book of Mormon, Alma, the 19th chapter. And then it shall come to pass that the spirits of those who are righteous are received into a state of happiness, which is called paradise, a state of rest, a state of peace, where they shall rest from all their troubles and from all care and sorrows. And from the Book of Doctrine and Covenants, section 22, This is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. In this celebration, uh, four, four people will, will help us celebrate. All four of them love Dad. And the first person to share will be Nan. Nan from Nan. Nan Hayes from Robertsdale. Nan. I once heard my young pastor speak at a funeral and, and something that he said always has stayed with me since then. Um, he was speaking to the family of um, a deceased member of our congregation at Robertsdale and he said, you know, a lot of people who lose someone have no idea what's going to happen next. They're not sure about the relationship that their loved one had with Christ or if they had one at all. And, you know, they have to not only deal with their grief, but they also have to deal with those thoughts about what's going to happen next, you know. and the person that he was speaking to at the time, you know, there was no doubt. He was a deacon in our church and he was an amazing man and he, you know, served in the military. And the same thing applies to Ed. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is going to his mansion and that he and we have nothing to worry about. So this is a celebration to me because of some of the experiences I've had with Ed in the last two weeks. If you know where Ed is now and you have wonderful fond memories of Ed, especially if he shared his knowledge with you or he was in a priesthood class with you, please Remember him by smiling. Let me see some joy on your faces. Because this is a celebration of a man who lived a wonderful 87 years. And I can't think of a better way to celebrate his life than to talk to you about the Ed Bapa that I knew and loved. He and I had something really great in common, and that was a love of growing things. He loved to get his hands dirty and plant trees. He loved flowers. I have several in my yard that he grew for me. And um, he did something kind of amazing, actually. He took a seed from an orange and grew an orange tree from it. That's not really difficult, you know, for some people it might be. The amazing thing was that this tree actually grew and produced edible fruit. Most of the time, I don't know how familiar you are with citrus, um, a seedling a lot of times won't bear fruit, and if it does, then the fruit is unedible, too bitter or too sour. This thing had amazing, huge oranges. It might be a new 
for all we know, a variety of orange. It could be the Ed Orange. <laughs> but here's the thing. When Ed planted it, he planted it in an area that was a little bit too shady. And so instead of the normal, huge, round, lush orange trees you're used to, this one grew straight up and was really spindly and only had the fruit in the very top of the tree. And I mean, this tree was above the roof of his house. And Ed, being Ed, with this amazing work ethic and the love of being outdoors and getting his hands dirty, and for some reason never remembering his age, he could not stand the thought of those oranges not being harvested. So he would get this extension ladder and lean it against these spindly limbs of this spindly orange tree, climb to the top, picture this, he's swaying in the breeze, you know, on limbs that are not meant to hold the weight of a man and a ladder. And he, holding on with one hand, picks the oranges with the other. For years, Jennifer fascinating, me, you know, Baba, please, just tell me when they're ready. When you think they're ready, let me come get them. Do you think he ever did? Nope. Another time, I'm coming to Jennifer's and to pick her up, and I wheel around to their back door. I get out of my car, and I'm about to bebop into the house, and there is Ed Fleming on the roof. This was just like a year and a half ago. It was about 85 years old. And I'm just dumbfounded. And finally I was like, Papa, what are you doing? And, it, and no answer. Ed, why are you on the roof? What's that? Huh? Over and over again. Why, Ed, why are you on the roof? Hmm? Finally, he tells me that he is searching for a leak. And I say, Papa, you know, people do this for a living. We could call somebody to climb up there and pour tar all over your roof. <laughs> you know, please get down. What would you say? So finally, you know, because I'm worried that this 85-year-old man is on his roof. And I'm getting frustrated because I know, I see his hearing aids, I know he can hear me. So you know how a lot of women do, or I do anyway, you know, you're starting to get frustrated and you do the and stomp your foot and I was like, Papa, you have got to get down, you're giving me a heart attack. He does this number, which led me to know he could hear me the whole time. then I think you need to go inside and check on Jenna because she's having one too. <laughs> <laughs> so I go in and I was like, what is wrong with him? You know, what is he doing? Is it just that he doesn't trust anybody else to do the work? Or, you know, what's going on? He has got too much confidence in himself you know, for an 85-year-old man. Jennifer says, nope, he's just crazy. <laughs> and you know, the more I thought about it, I was like, he really is crazy. He is. Most of the time, most of us have mamas that tell us to hide our crazy. Ed embraced his crazy. So, you know, Jennifer and I decided right then that he actually taught us a lesson, though. Lesson number one was that elderly men with hearing aids are only as deaf as they want to be. And number two, God does answer prayers, and we will never have any doubt about it because every single time that he climbed a tree or climbed a ladder or was on the roof of the house or fell down pushing the lawn mower or had power tools in his hands, nothing catastrophic happened, so God does answer prayers. One of the last times that I saw him, 
Jen and I visited him in rehab, and he <clears throat> was, we knew he had been reminiscing, and we were visiting with him, and he looks at me and winks and gets this big grin on his face, and he says, you and me and Jenna, we've had some adventures, haven't we? I said, yes, sir, we sure have. And I knew immediately what he was talking about. See, a few years ago, Jennifer and I had been working together at Camp Scamp. And Ed came early to load all of her stuff. And he came into the dining hall to check on us and see how much longer we were going to be. And it's kind of a tradition that none of the staff leaves until all of the children have been picked up and have gone home. So I said, Papa, we're going to be a little while yet. And he's like, okay, well, I'm going to go get Bruiser, and we're going to go for a walk. Say what? Bruiser is their dog who never even bit his own fleas, but just the size of him was intimidating. I mean, he could have been called Pony instead of Bruiser. So I was like, oh. No, you know, because we have a no pet rule at the campgrounds. And Bruiser was Bapa's best friend. So, you know, he was not going to brook anybody saying anything about him having Bruiser there. So I could just see disaster written all over this. And, of course, I run and tell on him to Jennifer. I was like, you will never guess what your dad is doing. And I was thinking it was kind of funny because it was her dad, you know, doing something inappropriate instead of mine. So I said, um, he is taking a bruiser around these campgrounds. And she was like, oh no, you know, if the director of the campgrounds or the custodian finds out, this could be bad. I was like, I don't know, you know. But I said, he's walking, you know, towards the lake, so maybe he's going to go around the lake and maybe we won't get caught. And she was like, okay, because I could just see us being banned from the campgrounds, you know, if Bapa had a fit about that dog. So we were busy with kids and, and doing the camp logs, and some time went by, and I thought, I better go check on him. And I told Jennifer I was going to, and... I started out the door and I'm looking around, made sure he wasn't close by, and I head down towards the lake. And I get almost to the waterfront. I get past an azalea and look, and oh my goodness, there is Bapa with no shirt on. I have no idea what's under the water. And him and the dog are cavorting in the lake. Now this is a big no-no because the gate was locked and there was no lifeguard. He had no human buddy with him, so he was breaking all kinds of rules. And I seriously for a moment thought that he had some kind of psychotic episode. But I got a little closer and I didn't want to startle him and I was like, Bapo? what are you doing? And he said, oh, me and Bruiser got a little warm, so we decided to take a dip and cool off, and I'm giving him a bath. And I was like, so I knew nothing was wrong with him, and I could hear him talking to the dog, too. And I was like, Bapa, you know, you're not supposed to be down here. There's no lifeguard. Oh, we can swim? That's not the point, Bapa. Finally... He says, we'll be done in a few minutes. And so I'm, uh, okay. I'm going back up to the dining hall to let Jennifer know I'm tattling again. And it, I'm, I'm just absolutely sure that we're all going to get banned from the campgrounds. And, she, and I tell her, she is beside herself, you know, has he lost his mind? He knows better. He knows that there's not even supposed to be pets here. And then I start thinking, oh my goodness, what if he steps in a hole or the dog knocks him down, he's in his 80s, I better get back down there. But I didn't want him to think that I was spying on him, and plus I still didn't know what kind of bottoms he had on. And so, you know, I would go down there and I would just get behind the azalea and peek, and finally, 
he, you know, I know he spotted me because he kept saying stuff to the dog like, you know, I don't know why they don't trust us. We can swim, blah, blah, blah. Um, finally, I convinced him to come in, and he does have on shorts. And he tells me that they'll be there in a few minutes to just go on. And that's when I spot the towels. This was totally premeditated. It was not a spur of the moment thing. The man planned the entire time to um, give his dog this amazing swim. See, the dog loved water, and he was Baba's best friend. So how can you stay mad at a man who loved his pet so much that he was willing to break all these rules and let the dog have the great swim. The last couple of times that Jen and I saw him at rehab, um, one of those times after we visited and we were getting ready to go, I asked him if he wanted to have prayer. You're, you're learning a lot about Ed about the real Ed. <laughs> and he was saying a prayer, and he, when I paused for the Lord to give me, you know, the right words to say to him, he picked up the prayer, and he prayed. And then when he stopped, I closed the prayer. And the next time we were there, the same thing happened when Jennifer started the prayer. When she paused, Ed picked up the prayer. And then she finished. And both of the times that he prayed, he prayed with so much gratitude for the amazing life that he had, for his family and his church family, for the scripture that God has given us, for it, that he led his life by. He was so at peace, so unafraid. His faith was so strong. It made it a lot easier for Jennifer to be able to say goodbye and let him go. You know, uh, it's my prayer and my blessing for all of us that our faith our belief and our love and our Heavenly Father will match His so that when the time comes, we have no fear, only love and joy and peace in our hearts. Thank you. Thank you. There's a lot of, for those of you who don't know well, there's a lot of insight into what Nan, and in case you didn't know, this is Nan Hayes from, uh, from Robertsdale. The next person who is going to help us celebrate is Rod Tillman. Now, if you have noticed, Rod's not here. Uh, he's, he's in McKinney, Texas, but his good friend George is here. And so George will explain all of that. Well, Larry's partially right. Um, I'm representing two people. I feel like I need to say something on my own for about Ed. I visited Ed in rehab, and we had prayer too, Nan, the day I visited him. And when I walked in the door, Ed was alert, and he uh, was eating. He was scarfing his food down. And frankly, I was a little surprised when he had passed away because I thought he was going to walk away from that place. Uh, and I'm going to miss him as well. I found him to be one of the most joyous persons. Uh, he always had a smile on his face. He had a good word for everybody. And I felt very close to Ed. His, his uh, wife, Charlene, and my mother uh, shared the same birth day, not the same year. They were about 25 or 30 years apart. And my dad and Ed shared the same birthday. So that was a, quite an unusual arrangement. They both had the same birthday as my mom and dad. 
Now, the other guy that I'm representing, is, as Larry gave you a hint, is Rod Tillman. And Rod, uh, I'll, when I read this, Rod, if some of you don't remember Rod, he grew up in Mobile and on the Eastern Shore, uh, specifically around Fairhope and Robertsdale, uh, where he went to high school. And Rod was our Mission Center president in this area uh, a number of years ago, 2004 to 2008, as a matter of fact. So I had let Rod know that Ed was sick, and then when Ed passed away, I called Rod and we visited on several occasions and texted back and forth a couple of times. And he was really concerned because he had sent Ed a card and he was concerned that Ed would have seen this card before he passed away because he wanted to convey some things to him. And so I called Jennifer and she verified that uh, Ed had seen the card and had read it from front to back and took great pleasure in it. And when I let Rod know, he was much relieved because he thinks so much of Ed. So let me just read the card to you. Rod has good handwriting, but I retyped it so it, I wouldn't make any mistakes. Hi, Ed. John Sebastian and George Farnell called and let me know you were under the weather and not doing well. Sorry to hear that, but knowing you reminds me of that Timex watch commercial. You can take a licking, but keep on ticking. Some of the highlights of my growing up as a young man was working with you on that milk truck and sharing in the conversation, stories, and laughter as we rode together. And how can I forget arriving at the Woodhaven Dairy Plant and eating all that free ice cream? I still love ice cream, but Woodhaven had the best. They had that old-fashioned real black cherry that you can't get anymore. Those times with you bring back a lot of memories, and I always looked up to you as a mentor and role model. Thank you for those memories and life lessons of what it meant to, be, to really be a man. I always appreciated not only your physical strength, but also your wisdom and unselfish nature. To me, you were and always will be the man. You are one that I hold in high regard, I hope you get better soon. You are in my thoughts and prayers. Give Jennifer a big hug. Love, G-Rod. Who remembers Woodhaven Dairy? Work, work there. So, uh, old-fashioned black cherry ice cream. Uh, Rod mentioned Ed's physical strength. Uh, now, to appreciate this, you got to know Rod. Most of you knew Rod, but for the, those of you who didn't, Rod was a man. Uh, he was a scholarship football player to Florida State. Uh, he uh, he was a man, and. Uh, Green Beret, slugged it out in Vietnam. And for him to call someone the man is a, is a real compliment. Rod, and I shared this with uh, Terry and Randy, Rod once told me that Ed Fleming, pound for pound, was the strongest person he ever knew. And uh, Terry verified that the men at the paper mill respected Ed's strength and that uh, uh, they didn't mess with Ed, right? The next person to help us celebrate is Ed's uh, daughter, Jennifer.
when Daddy went to the hospital February 12th. I was very shocked. My life has changed. But it's okay. It's changed for the best. Not for me, but for my dad. Was a great man. My dad has always done wonderful things for me and with me. Growing up, it was a struggle. I remember as a child, he would take me to physical therapy. He went there one time to watch him do therapy. He cried the whole time on the way home. He asked me if he didn't have to do that no more. I said, only if you promised I wouldn't have to do it. He says, I can't promise that. He says, but every time you go, I'll promise you a Dixie do. I love Dixie dogs and Dixie do. So every time I went to physical therapy, I knew I was getting a Dixie dog and a Dixie do. Little realizing they would catch up on me when I got old and they stuck to me on the wrong places. <laughs> Gee, thanks, Dad. But they kept him from crying. He taught me right from wrong. The older he got, the more I loved him. I never knew what would come out of him. As I thought about how to describe my mother, how in the world could I describe such, such a wonderful human being? And I thought the best way to describe him was the bag of cracking jacks. I never knew what was coming out. But it was always a surprise. <laughs> it was some kind of, sometimes a nut, like the age of 84, no, 80, 81, my bad. He came out and said, Judy? I said, what? He said, you remember that dance? I said, okay now. Me uh, remembering the dance. So I am with the dancer. He said, yeah, yeah. But you got to teach me this. I thought, you're 81 and you want to dance? <laughs> oh, gosh. I said, Okay, let me write my brain what dance. He says, well, it's like a moon pie. 
was so, moon pie. What are you talking about? He says, yeah, you done that moon pie dance. I said, moon pie dance? He says, well, I think a black boy did this. I'm thinking, moon pie. Well, Mardi Gras was on, and that's where he got moon pie. And I thought, you mean the moon walk? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I thought, I said, well, do you have one glove? He said, no. I said, can't do it. He says, what does it have to do with I said, forget it there. So I showed them the steps. No, I won't show you. <laughs> if that was a private video, it's online, but you can pay me later. <laughs> so I showed them the steps. And he did the steps across my living room for about a week. Thank God he forgot. <laughs> Woo! At 81, here's this man doing the moon pie. <laughs> now, I don't know what in the... I mean, he came up with all kinds of questions, all kinds of things, and I'm thinking, what in the world possess you? Just second, third, fourth, fifth childhood? I don't know, but I've had it. He was a sweet father. Gave me everything up every morning. Never says no. All except for a few things, and I guess I didn't need those. The day he got and went to the nursing home and went to see him, And he got me to his bed. And he said, Jenny, I need to talk to you. And I said, what, Daddy? He says, I need to talk to you. I said, OK, let's talk. He pulled the hand down and grabbed mine. He says, will you hate me? He says, how can I hate you? I said, you've given me my entire life. Everything I've ever wanted and needed, and even if I didn't need it, how can I hate you? He says, well... I just saw a peak of your mother. I says, oh, you did? She looks mighty fine. I said, okay. He says, can I go home? I said, well, sure you can. He says, and you won't hate me if I don't come home? I said, no, sir. He says, well, I tell you what, I'll talk it out with God. I said, okay. And he says, in the meantime, go home and get my calendar. I said, okay, there's a calendar here and here. He said, no, my calendar. I said, what? He says, yeah, it ended 
at 31,452. I said, what? He said, it's about my bed. I says, okay, what? He says, that's how many days I've been at that. He says, I says, you've been counting the days you've been? He says, yes, I, I have a ritual with God. He says, one day I'm going to add up the hours and the minutes. I haven't done that yet. That's okay. And right beside his bed, he had a pad with it. He says, I'm looking for a number. I said, okay. And he had, I gave him his calendar. And the day he died was 31,484. He loved numbers. He told me he thanked God for every breath he took. And he told me to do the same. What a wonderful father. I know I can't live the way he did, but he was the greatest example. And I just hope that I can make him proud one day. Thank you for coming and supporting me. You know, as I close out our, our celebration, uh, as you can tell, those of us who have been asked to, to share personally about, about it, we kind of overflow, don't we? We kind of overflow. Uh, I uh, just want to mention his faith. Let's celebrate his faith. Uh, Ed had great faith. It was, it was, it was steadfast. It was deep, well thought out. But he didn't just have a faith, he, sh he shared it. He shared his faith. And he showed his faith. Uh, he showed it. He showed it through his works. And just one little personal memory there. Uh, when we would have fish fries here at the congregation, Ed would sell more fish dinners than anyone else. He would walk around his neighborhood, knock on the doors. I believe the key to his success, he took Bruiser with him. <laughs> he sold more fish fries. And Terry, I'll always remember, I'll always remember, one year, Terry sold 40 fish dinners at the paper mill. I wish I had a picture of, of Ed loading up that van, actually overloading that van. There were fish dinners everywhere, and I'll never forget that van uh, driving out, headed, headed towards the paper mill. Uh, he showed his face. He, he was a worker, a faithful man. I want to say just one little thing about a few of his favorite things. I'm just going to mention them. 
few of his favorite things is football. And I know football is unimportant. I know that, but how can you celebrate uh, Ed without just mentioning he was a Bama fan. Uh, and all I need to do is show you his Bible. Uh, the good news is he, he, he read it so much that it, it began to fall apart. And so he had to put tape on it and look at the tape he put on it. He was a Bama fan. Uh, one of his favorite things, one of his favorite things was, uh, was the Book of Mormon. Ed loved the Book of Mormon. And Sonny, Sonny Goff, are you here? Uh, Ed, Sonny, he admired you, appreciated you for your, for your knowledge and your witness of the Book of Mormon. Uh, most of all, his favorite thing was Charlene. And don't tell her I called her a thing but Charlene, uh, on an early visit with Ed in the nursing home, uh, had a visit I'll always treasure. Ed was very weak, very weak, uh, couldn't even keep his eyes open. His voice was weak, but his mind was sharp. And he just began to reminisce about growing up in Wisconsin, about his parents, about, about being baptized at the age of 12 in the swimming pool at the YMCA because the lakes and streams were all frozen. And then he began to relate how he and Charlene met and fell in love. And let me witness, uh, his voice was weak but it got stronger and got warm as, as he related. Uh, and some of you know this, but Ed lived in Robertsdale at the time. Uh, Charlene lived in Mobile. And it seemed that once a month, our youth in Robertsdale would come to Mobile and uh, to be with the youth in Mobile, socialize, play volleyball, and it seems that that's where, that's where Ed and Charlene met. And, and once again, as he, as he related, as he related how Charlene paid attention to him, he just, his face, his eyes may have been closed, but his face his face just glowed. And you, you know the rest of the story. Uh, they fell in love. Uh, Ed loved Charlene, but he also trusted her. I'm told by the children that, that Ed would get a paycheck, and he'd hand, he'd hand that paycheck over to, to, uh, to Charlene, trusting her to take good care of the money. Love and trust. Love and trust. Uh, now, I'm sure just like all of us, they had their ups and downs, but that, that love and trust enabled them to, to hold together and to uh, weather the storms of life. And Ed, uh, Ed missed Charlene. She, she died in 2009. Uh, he missed Charlene until, until Wednesday. So what about, what about uh, Ed's future? What about his future? Uh, I hope we'll find peace, hope we'll find peace in knowing, in knowing that, uh, that Ed was ready to step through that doorway of death. He was ready, wasn't he, Terry? He was ready, he was ready. Uh, uh, Terry, Randy, and Jennifer were able to, to uh, spend a lot of time with Ed the last part of his life. 
and I'm sure all of them will have uh, precious memories. Uh, Terry, uh, Terry shared a memory that just proves that dads will always be dad. Uh, they served Ed kind of a piece of steak there at the home. And so Ed was going to be kind and cut that steak up. Now, Ed, ha uh, Terry has a habit. He cuts it longitudinally first, lengthwise, before he cuts it up into small pieces. You hear that, Sheila? Say, I'm not the only one. Well, after, after Terry got it cut longitudinally, Ed said, that's too big. I, I can't eat that. I'll choke on that. So, uh, so fathers will be fathers. Uh, Randy was telling me how he bribed his dad one night at the nursing home with ice cream. With ice cream. Um, Seems Ed wouldn't eat the food they brought him, so, so, um, so Randy kind of bribed him and said, "Well, listen, if you'll eat some more of this food, I'll go go get go get you some ice cream." And so he did, and bribery worked. Ed ate ate more of that food, and uh, Randy gave him that ice cream, and he he enjoyed it. And you know, I don't know this, but I believe. I believe that as your dad ate that ice cream, Randy, he was thinking about eating that old-fashioned black cherry Woodhaven ice cream 70 years ago. What do you think? What do you think? So, uh, precious memories. Ed was ready to go. He was ready. He was missing Charlene, missing Suzanne. He was ready to go. He was no longer blessed by living in this life. His body was worn and weary. He was ready to lay it down. He was ready to go because he was fully confident in God's promise of eternal life. And so let's find peace in knowing that Ed was at peace stepping into eternal life. And let's find peace in knowing we'll be with him again. We'll be with him again. Uh, we don't look at death like the world does. To the world, the world dreads a funeral. They dread a memorial service. For them, a funeral is kind of a final goodbye, you know, the final goodbye. But we Christians, we celebrate this memorial service. Uh, for us, this is, and if you'll forgive me, it's, it's a sacred going away party, isn't it? The sacred going away party. Ed's gone away, and today we're we're sending him off. And Ed's gone away, and in the future we will all go and join him. And those of you who know me, you've heard me say this often, and I'm, I'm going to keep saying it. For Christians, there is never a final goodbye. Never a final goodbye. It's always, see you later, see you later. And so, uh, and so let's, uh, let's find peace in knowing that we will see Ed later. And let's find peace in just knowing where he is, where he is. This place, the Bible calls heaven paradise uh, what kind of place is it well in those three scriptures that I read we learn this is a place that Jesus prepared just for Ed a mansion and Jesus will be there we learn that this is a place that is 
uh, a place of happiness, peace, rest, a place where Ed can rest from his troubles, cares, and sorrows. And we learn it's a place that God calls my work and my glory. And, and the truth is, God has given us this big picture, but he hasn't given us a lot of details. It's as if he tells us, you know I love you, and so just trust me to, to leave the details up to me. And so that's what we do. Once again, it all gets back to love and trust. We know that, we know that God loves us. Ed, and, and, and just, like, just like Ed would hand his paycheck over to Charlene and trust her to take good care of that paycheck, today we are we're handing Ed over to God and we're trusting him to take good care of Ed until, until, we, until we see him, see him later. And I want to send us forth with just one little thought, one little thought. And it relates to a, a little ritual, a little ritual. Uh, Charlene died nine years ago, and so f since then, Jennifer and Ed have they've taken care of each other. And they have this little, it's a simple little ritual they do at nighttime. When one's ready to go to bed, that person will say, good night, and I love you more. And the other one will protest, no, I love you more. And they'll keep swapping the, no, I love you more, no, I love you more. And this was their ritual every night until recently it ended in the nursing home. Uh, one day, as Jennifer got ready to leave, she, uh, she said, well, Dad, good night, and I love you more. And Ed said, no, I love you more, and I'm sick, so I win. <laughs> and Jennifer replied, yes, Dad. You win. For me, that little simple story tells us all we really need to know about our Christian faith in death. Tells us all we really need to know. We win we win. Uh, in this service, we celebrate because Thursday, Ed won. He won. So let's stand. And let's proclaim our Christian faith. Death, where's your sting? Grave, where is your victory? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, man is going to have prayer, and, and after which I want to invite all of you, and the family invites all of you to gather in the fellowship hall and where we will continue our celebration. Would you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, as we come to the close of this service, we have much to be grateful for, for the amazing man in the 87 years that he walked this path with us and shared with us. And Father, we're also grateful for your loving spirit that was here with us this evening, 
lifting us up, sharing with us the peace that you blessed Ed with. May his children and family and friends take with them from this service the sure knowledge that he is in your presence that he is planting flowers for Bruiser to dig up. That he leaves behind a legacy of an amazing faith, a heart filled with peace and joy that he had as a servant for you. Lord, may we all take these things with us in your son's most holy name. Amen.